show. All the way from Arizona State University, it's the most exciting 15 minutes on YouTube. Come on down, because you're the next contestant on The Price is Ever Changing. Guess the right price without going over, and you could be the winner of this brand new bedroom set. Real mahogany wood with a matching vanity just like your grandmother used to have. What do you think it's worth? Now, the trick to winning game shows like this one, or The Price is Right, the real life version we're shamelessly spoofing, isn't just wearing the funniest, most eye-grabbing t-shirt while you scream from the studio audience. To really nail the price of a new car, a washer dryer, or a real mahogany wood bedroom set, contestants have to think about more than how much they value the item on the pedestal. They have to figure out how much people in general are willing to pay for it, as well as how high the price needs to be for people making a car or toaster to decide to produce it in the first place. And it's not always easy, as any contestant can tell you. When conditions in the marketplace change, the prices of goods and services change with them. And like game show contestants, economists have to pay really close attention to these changes. Not just because they're competing to win some new furniture. Hi, I'm Matt Sofa, and this is The Price is Ever Changing! I mean, study hall. <clears throat> Macroeconomics. First up in our cast of characters influencing the price of goods, we have the demanders. Now, these aren't just pushy people saying they want something now. They're everyone who purchases any goods or services. Whether it's a huge purchase like a car, a house, or Luke Skywalker's lightsaber from the original 1977 Star Wars, priced at $450,000 or just a pack of gum at the gas station. The way we spend our money makes every single one of us part of the demand group. And while we all know what it is to want something really, 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 really bad, the intricate ballet that is economics means that demand is more nuanced than your deep, burning desire for a vintage movie prop. Since all of economics operates in an environment of scarcity, or the unavoidable fact that we'll never have all the money, time, or stuff us demanders have to prioritize our wants and needs, and all other things being equal, people are more likely to spend when prices lower because we don't have to give up as many resources or other options our money could buy. If I'm trying to upgrade my kitchen game, I'm more likely to pull the trigger on that air fryer I've been eyeing when it goes on sale. That way I have money left over for a fancy electric tea kettle and a knife set sharp enough to cut the throats of my enemies. I mean, Chop a sweet potato. The relationship between price and quantity demanded is known as the law of demand. It's a pretty fundamental assumption in economics. As price increases, quantity demanded goes down. And inversely, when price dips, quantity demanded rises. We can see how price affects demand by looking at a demand curve, which is a hypothetical graph that shows what quantity of a good or service will be demanded at all possible price points. We can expect that as price increases, demand will drop accordingly. Although in economics, as in life, sometimes things don't go as expected, which is a hint for economists to take a closer look at what else might be going on. But more often than not, the law of demand holds true. Take the egg market in 2022. At the beginning of the year, egg prices averaged a buck 25 per dozen. But as the months went on, that price rose and rose and rose, hitting nearly $2 by the end of the year, almost doubling. Production was plagued literally by an avian flu, reducing available supply and leading to those higher prices. Based on the law of demand, we can expect that as price went up, demand dipped, which is exactly what happened. As this previously bargain breakfast suddenly cost almost twice as much, people were more likely to opt for something cheaper, like oatmeal, which has a lower opportunity cost, and also more fiber. We call the amount of whatever good, say eggs, consumers will buy at each price point, quantity demanded. So we can say that the quantity demanded for eggs at the end of 2022 was lower than it was 12 months earlier, before egg prices rose nearly a dollar. But don't get it scrambled. The quantity demanded isn't static, and it isn't just set by price. The entire demand curve can shift to the left, meaning that people will buy fewer of this item at any given price, or to the right, 
meaning that people will buy more at even overall higher prices. One thing that can really affect quantity demanded is actually the availability of other kinds of goods available in the market. Sofa's Summer Hut is my favorite kind of market because Beach King and business proprietor Matt Sofa has got everything you need to spend a day swimming, surfing, and falling asleep under an umbrella. Beach King Matt found that his display of battery-operated fans sold much better when he added a display of batteries right next to it. And even better when he dropped the price of batteries from $7 a pack to $5.50. That's because batteries are a complementary good to our original fans, meaning they go together. So dropping the price of one leads to an increase in demand of the other. On the other hand, when he introduced a new brand to his sunscreen display, he expected to sell more sunscreen in total. But he quickly discovered that, for the most part, the new sunscreen was just a substitute good, which could replace the original good in the customer's shopping cart. And since this substitute sunscreen was a dollar cheaper and it smelled like bananas, it actually decreased demand for the original sunscreen. As Matt correctly identifies complementary and substitute goods in his store, he can work to provide a more balanced inventory. But even as supply and demand changes every minute of every day, there's one thing for sure. Nothing can substitute a cold pina colada on a hot afternoon. But while complementary and substitute goods have a huge influence on demand, they aren't the only things that can shift the demand curve. If income and wealth rise, people have more money to spend and they typically buy more, even at higher price points. The number of buyers compared to goods can also shift the demand curve. Think limited edition sneakers, farewell tour concert tickets. When there are fewer goods compared to people who want to buy them, more people are down to pay more to catch a glimpse of Mick Jagger at the Stones farewell tour. Or maybe the farewell tour after that, or the one after that. Expectations for the future can also change how much or how little consumers demand. If you think prices for new cars will go up in the future because your local psychic told you they would, you're more likely to go out and buy a new car now, regardless of current price. Similarly, if she tells you that you'll soon come into vast amounts of wealth under mysterious circumstances, you might start spending more in anticipation of your definitely not suspicious inheritance. On the flip side, when people in general are bracing for job losses or other economic downturns, we can see a drop in demand as people preemptively tighten their belts, shifting the curve to the left. Trends and preferences can influence the demand curve too. Look at the humble little Stanley Tumblr, a huge water cup made by a century old camping supply brand. When social media influencers began sipping their water from these cups and raving about their features, demand for the cups skyrocketed and the demand curve moved to the right. But demand isn't the only thing making the market go round and influencing the correct answers on our definitely not plagiarized game show, The Price is Ever Changing. We need those suppliers making all those eggs, sunscreens, and very trendy insulated camping tumblers. And the supply side of things has just as much influence in our economy as demand. Suppliers, or the people and firms that produce and sell goods and services, have different priorities than demanders, but they're still motivated by that central economic idea of scarcity, that with limited resources, they'd better allocate wisely. And for firms, that means maximizing the money they get to pocket after covering the cost of whatever they're producing, known as profit. Just like the law of demand, we've got a, you guessed it, law of supply. It states that all other factors being equal, an increase in the price of a good will lead to an increase in the quantity supplied. The reverse is true too. As market price falls, firms will likely respond by supplying fewer goods. That's because the lower the price of a good, the less profit firms reel in. In the case of my fictional beach shop, if it costs me $100 to produce a boogie board, which is sold for $120, then I'm just not making that much. A measly 20 bucks per product. So maybe I'll make something else, like surfboards, which cost about the same to produce, but can be sold for $200. And since I only have so much manufacturing capacity, I'm gonna wanna get the most bang for my buck, or profit for my goods. Which in this case means making more surfboards and fewer boogie boards. But if I could sell my boogie boards for $150, that increased profit might just be enough to keep on boogieing. Uh, I mean, producing boogie boards. Like a demand curve, a supply curve illustrates the expected relationship between price and quantity supplied, showing the lowest price at which firms will even bother to produce the good in the first place, with production going up as the price goes up too. But it isn't just market price that can influence suppliers. And just like our demand curve, there are tons of factors that can shift the entire supply curve to the left or the right, meaning producers will either make more or less of a given product selling at any price. Like, if something becomes cheaper to make because the price of raw materials goes down or new technology helps streamline the production process, firms are gonna up their production. 
Those lower manufacturing costs means more money left over for that sweet, sweet profit. If new technology lets me make boogie boards for the bargain price of 50 bucks a pop, and I could still sell them for 120 bucks each, that's suddenly a $70 profit instead of just 20 bucks. The same is true in the reverse. If it's suddenly more expensive to produce a good, firms are gonna start supplying less. Can't have those increased costs cutting into your profit, am I right? And suppliers are just as influenced by clairvoyant Carly as demanders are, or, you know, more reputable economic forecasters. If firms think they'll be able to get higher prices for their goods in the future, they'll supply less today and plan to rake in more profit selling once prices rise. Because suppliers want to sell at higher prices and demanders want to buy at low prices, the laws of supply and demand may seem at odds. But instead of the back and forth tug of war between supply and demand actually drives prices to a balance point, a magical rate, which is not only the perfect game show answer, but where producers are motivated to provide the same quantity that demanders want to buy. We can find that point by graphing our supply and demand curves on the same plane. The spot where they meet is that cozy place known as market equilibrium, where the push-pull of suppliers and demanders settles into a rate that makes profit for firms, but is still affordable enough for households to want to buy. Of course, we know there are tons of things that can shift both supply and demand. We've just spent an entire episode talking about them. That means market equilibrium is constantly shifting too, and that can mean big things for the economy as a whole. Understanding the laws of supply and demand, plus the forces in the market that can shift those curves, can give insight as to why your favorite cereal might be $6 one month and $8 the next. It explains the impact of high prices for staple products like eggs and why the Beach King is gonna prioritize making and selling surfboards over boogie boards. And most importantly of all, it gives you the secret formula to winning our patented game show the price is ever changing. And all it takes is a little graphing and a lot of attention to our constantly shifting markets. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall macroeconomics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you wanna help us out, give this video a like, comment, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.